at Lancaster Baptist Church, and thank you for being faithful. The uh, season of the fall is always a busy time here with the school, the college, the church, and so many things on the horizon. And the best way that we can encourage our pastors to just get on board with everything that's going on. And uh, I know, you know, during the summer, you kind of get maybe a little different schedule and you take some vacation time or things are disrupted a little bit. But boy, when the fall comes, the best thing we can do is just uh, get right back into the schedule that pastor sets for us with respect to services and prayer times and soul winning and all the things of the church. And uh, that will ease the pressure from his mind, knowing that uh, we the people are behind what God's doing here and uh, love it and want to serve the Lord together. And so you pray for him and pray for this season of busyness. We've got a lot of things going on for sure. And he bears so much of that burden. And we can lift that burden by just being in our place, can't we? And so thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for those that met with him earlier. I know that was a great encouragement to him. And I've been encouraged by the service tonight. I was interested to learn, however, when Brother Baloo was talking about his church over there in Thailand, he mentioned that the preacher that preached this morning, that he trained, he trained for five and a half years. The guy who led the singing, he trained for seven years. I'm not sure if that's an indictment on the Thai people or on their teacher. But uh, that, that kind of made me feel bad. I don't know why. I guess anybody can preach. It takes some real skill to lead music, I'll tell you that. And uh, we sure benefit from all the great preparation around here, don't we? The choir and the specials and all the things that we get to enjoy. The children's choir tonight, what a tremendous... That didn't just happen. Somebody had to spend some time uh, with those young people. And thank you, parents, for letting them be a part of the service tonight. Well, let's go to Judges, chapter 13. Judges, chapter 13. We're going to look at several verses uh, that deal with the life of a man that I think we all are fairly familiar. His name is Samson. Judges, chapter 13. And let's read the last two verses of chapter 13, as this is the beginning of his life. In verse 24, it says, And the woman bare a son, and called his name Samson. And the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtaol. Time is our brief opportunity to fulfill God's purpose in our life. Time ends. There is no time in eternity. There are no minutes, hours, days, decades, millenniums in heaven or hell. We base so much of our life on time, on schedules, on planning things coming. But understand that time, as we know it, one day ends. And so time, we must recognize, is our opportunity to fulfill God's purpose for our life. Now, God uniquely designs each of our lives to fulfill the purpose that he has for us. In Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5, God said to Jeremiah, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet to the nations. So before Jeremiah was born, God's purpose, God's design was already in place. And Jeremiah simply in his time on earth fulfilled that purpose as a prophet. We read the same about the apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 1 where he says in verse 15, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. 
Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. So Paul understood that there was a purpose for his life. There was a design that God had in mind. And Paul was able to end his life saying, I have finished my course. He had completed the purpose for which God had designed his life to complete. So God creates each of us in his own distinct and creative way to fulfill a purpose. Now, God had created Samson for a purpose. We see it back in chapter 13. If you want to go back to verse 3 of Judges 13, the angel of the Lord, in verse 3, appeared unto the woman, Samson's mom, and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive, and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine or strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So God's purpose for creating Samson, for designing this child, was that he would be a judge, he would be a deliverer to the nation of Israel from the hand of their enemy, the Philistines. Now understand that while we might think, well, yeah, but Jeremiah, he's a pretty, pretty special guy, and Paul, he was certainly an outstanding vessel of God, and Samson, okay, God had a purpose for his life, but I'm not so sure that's true about me. But the psalmist said, in Psalm 139, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. Do you understand what the psalmist is saying there is before we came out of the womb, before we even had a body, a skeletal frame, when we were just being formed there, when our, our members, our arms, our legs had not yet grown, be, before all of that, God already had a purpose for our life and had it written in a book. God has uniquely designed every man, woman, teenager, child in this room tonight for a purpose. So we must look at our life right now and ask ourselves to this point, have I fulfilled that purpose? Have I even allowed God to show me what that purpose is for my life? Have I allowed God to direct my steps? Have I allowed him to guide my life? Have I allowed his will to be known in my life that I might complete my race for Jesus Christ? Now, you might think, well, I have time to worry about all that. I got a lot on my plate right now. I, I'm busy. I, I have a family. I have work. I have all these things. And uh, uh, somewhere along the line, I'll figure it out. I, I've got time to worry about God's purpose later. David Brainerd was born in 1718 to a farming family in Haddam, Connecticut. Brainerd upon his parents' death early in his life, set his sights on the clergy and the study of God's Word. He went to Yale College in 1739, but in his first year, he began to struggle with his health, often spitting up blood. It was the early signs of tuberculosis. During his time there at Yale, under the preaching of George Whitfield, there was a division that took place among the Presbyterians. Under Whitfield's preaching, there was a revival that was beginning to stir in the halls of Yale. And the old school Presbyterians didn't like it. They called this movement the New Lights. And Brainerd, along with several other students, began to separate from the college. In fact, in 
November of 1741, Brainerd was reported as saying that one of the local ministers, who was also a college instructor, had no more grace than a chair. The president of Yale, Thomas Clapp, heard that remark and expelled him. Officially now barred from the ministry, Brainerd set out as an itinerant preacher. He began to preach in various churches and areas, and pastors began to take note of his godliness and his zeal for God's Word. He was recommended to perhaps think of missions, and he joined up with John Sargent in 1743 and became a missionary to the Stockbridge Indians. Later, he was ordained in New York, 1744. But from 1743 until 1747, he ministered to the Indians of western Massachusetts, eastern New York, the Lehigh Valley area of Pennsylvania, as well as central New Jersey, where much of his great work was done. Out of these experiences as a missionary to these Indian tribes, Jonathan Edwards, who is known for his um, work during the First Great Awakening, came to know David Brainerd and got a hold of some of his journals, some of the things that he wrote about life and ministry as a missionary. It was Edwards that publicized these writings, these journals. Brainerd was engaged to be married to the love of his life, but tuberculosis had weakened his body. He never married. He didn't live long enough. You see, David Brainerd died at the age of 29. And yet, because of the publication of his journals by Jonathan Edwards, those missionary journals of David Brainerd were the impetus that stirred the hearts of some of the greatest missionaries of all time. Men like William Carey, determined to go to the mission field as a result of David Brainerd's life. Likewise, years later, Jim Elliott, the martyred missionary of the Auka Indians, was inspired toward missions because of what he read about David Brainerd. 29 years of time, and yet the world is the beneficiary of the purpose for which he was created. It's amazing in our culture today, most 29-year-olds are still kind of hooked on video games. We aren't even quite past that stage yet. As we survey our life, we may think, oh, there's time for God, there's time for His purpose later. In your life right now, have you fulfilled God's purpose? Samson should have been one of the greatest success stories of the Bible. He would have been voted most likely to succeed. God's hand was on him from the very start. But I want you to see tonight a series of steps that turn victory into defeat. Notice the divine plan. We read in Judges 13, verses 3 through 5, that God had designed Samson's life, placed him under a Nazarite vow, that he might be a deliverer, a judge in the nation of Israel to overcome this nemesis of an enemy called the Philistines. His parents were to be pure. We read it there where his mother was told that there were certain things she was not to do during the pregnancy. There were things she was not to eat. There were things that she was not to do. Uh, there was to be no wine, no unclean meat. The Nazarite vow, if you want to study it later, is, is contained in Numbers chapter 6. And in Numbers chapter 6, it's outlined very carefully what this vow was. It uh, required that the person uh, drink no wine or strong drink no liquor of grapes, no moist grapes or dried, nothing eaten from the vine at all, no razor was to come to the, to the head, to the hair, 
Uh, they were not never to touch anything that was dead. In verse 8 of number 6, it says, basically, in a synopsis, they were to be holy unto the Lord. Now, you and I are not under a Nazarite vow, okay? We're not under that, that Old Testament Nazarite vow, as Samson was, but wouldn't you not agree with me tonight that all of us ought to have a desire as one of God's children to be holy? That we ought to desire to, to live a life of holiness as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to your former lusts and your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy even as I am holy. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. Why? Because we're a chosen generation. We're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. We're a peculiar people. And we should be showing forth the praises of him who called us out of darkness in his marvelous light. So our desire, though we're not under a Nazarite vow, we're not under some kind of a law that requires us, you can't do that or this, as Samson was, we ought to have a desire that our life would be holy, that it would be separated unto God. God's plan for our life, folks, is not happiness. God's plan for our life is holiness. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you? which you have of God, and you're not your own. For you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body and your spirit, which are God's. You know, if you, if you kind of run everything in your life through that filter, I belong to God. It will cause you to live a holy life. So here was a divine plan. But notice a demonstrated power that accompanied this plan. Now, sometimes when you see a picture of Samson in a commentary or perhaps in a book of some kind about his life, they picture him as this Herculean-looking guy, this guy with muscles on top of muscles. I don't think Samson looked like that at all. Now, I don't know exactly what he looked like, but nobody could figure out where his great strength lied. Nobody could figure out why he could do these amazing feats. So if he had been this, uh, you know, middle linebacker look, everybody figured, well, yeah, okay, he can do stuff I can't do. But nobody could figure out how he had such power. It was demonstrated in some amazing ways. Um, Samson's early life, there are no incidents of violation. Again, back in chapter 13, if you want to look at verse 24, as we read earlier, the woman bare a son, called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtael. So here's this young boy that's been designed for a specific purpose. He's under this Nazarite vow. His mother and father were very careful in fulfilling that vow, of placing him under that vow, they trained him, they taught him all of these requirements that were necessary for him to be used by God. And as a young person, God was moving through his life. And let's just follow a little bit of the story. Look at chapter 14 and verse 5. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath, and behold, a young lion roared against him. Now, if I leave church this afternoon and a, and a lion confronts me between here and my car, I'm forgetting my car. I'm running back in the building and calling security, right? That's not what Samson did. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him, the lion, as he would have rent a kid. And he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. Now, I don't know what would possess a person to want to tear a lion in half. But you see, this was the power of God being demonstrated through his life. Look, look at chapter 14, verse 19. It says, And the Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them and took their spoil and gave change of raiments unto them which expounded the riddle. 
Again, you can connect all these dots later if you wish, but here he kills 30 men, steals their clothing, and fulfills his pledge to the Philistines. Look at chapter 15, verse 4. And Samson went and caught 300 foxes. Have you ever caught a fox? Have you ever caught just one? He caught 300 and took firebrands and turned tail to tail and put a firebrand in the midst between two tails. And when he had set the brands on fire, he let them go into the standing corn of the Philistines and burnt up both the shocks and also the standing corn with the vineyards and the olives. Go to chapter 15, verse 13. I'm sorry, verse, uh, verse 7. And Samson said unto them, Though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I will cease. And he smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter, and he went down and dwelt in the top of the rock Edom. Down to verse uh, 13. And they spake unto him, saying, No, but we will bind thee fast and deliver thee into their hand, but surely we will not kill thee. And they bound him with two new cords and brought him up from the rock. And we came into Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands loosed from off his hands. Look at verse 15. And he found a new jawbone of an ass, and put forth his hand, and took it, the jawbone of the ass, and slew a thousand men therewith. Chapter 16, verse 2, And it was told the Gazites, saying, Samson has come hither, and they compassed him in, in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city, and were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. And Samson lay till midnight, and rose at midnight, took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts, and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders, and carried them up to the top of a hill that is before Hebron. Amazing demonstration of God's power over and over again in his life. Friends, don't get apathetic toward God's power in your life. Don't ever forget what it took God to save you. That's a miracle. And if God has used you in the slightest way with your family, in a church ministry, in your witness to a friend, if God uses you in the slightest way, please don't underestimate that that is God working through you. That is not us. That is God's power upon our life. Salvation has come to us, not because we deserve it, not because we're good, not because we've earned it. God's salvation is according to his mercy upon us. And if God chooses to use us in some way to help someone else, to encourage someone else, to bring someone else to Christ, that's not you. That's a demonstration of God's power. Here was a divine plan, a demonstrated power, but then sadly, we see a distorted purpose. Each of us, no matter how blessed in the past, still has a flesh. The Apostle Paul is one of those men we admire greatly for his dedication to the Lord, for his seemingly tireless energy to serve Jesus Christ with his life. And yet, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 7, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I would, I do not. And that which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that which I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. You see, the Apostle Paul, in all of the things that we would marvel at the power of God in his life, yet saw, Paul recognized that he was still yet flesh, and we need to recognize that as well. That's why Paul said later, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are the contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. If we're not careful... 
we see a little blessing of God in our life. And all of a sudden, the purpose of God gets distorted. Go back in the midst of these verses. Look at chapter 14 and verse 1. And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. Uh Uh-oh. Here's some distortion of purpose. A rebellion toward authority, a violation of God's plan. Chapter 14, verse 8, and after a time he returned to take her and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, the one that he killed. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and mother and he gave them and they did eat. But he told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. You remember the Nazarite vow in number six, touch no dead thing? Distorted purpose. Chapter 16, verse 1, Then went Samson to Geza and saw there an harlot and went in unto her. We don't need to read much further than that to know that that was certainly a violation of God's plan in his life. That was certainly not of God for him to violate his his sexual purity in this way. Chapter 16, verse 15. And she said unto him, this is Delilah now, how canst thou say I love thee when thine heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. It came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death that he told her all his heart and said unto her, There hath not come a razor upon mine head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, She sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand, and she made him sleep upon her knees. And she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. Samson's life is characterized by occasional victories over the enemy. But his life is filled with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Driven by human desires, human anger, human revenge, rather than driven by God's purpose for his life. Samson was living a reactionary life rather than an intentional life. How are we living ours? Every morning are we intentionally saying, all right, God, back to your purpose, back to why you designed me, back to why you made me, Let me walk in that purpose. Or do we just go on in the day and just react in our own human interests and desires to what comes our way? What describes our life tonight? Because sadly, we see, fourthly, a desperate prayer. I think one of the saddest verses in the Bible is chapter 16 and verse 20. And she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep 
and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. Samson awakens to the voice of Delilah, the Philistines beating upon the door. And he awakens to see the locks of his hair on the floor, another violation, an obvious violation. Some of the others he had kept secret, kept to himself, but this was now obvious. And Samson thought, I'll be okay. I can handle this. I mean, I've, I've rent a lion in half. I've walked away with the gates of the city. I've killed a thousand men with a, with a jawbone of an ass. I can, I can handle this. But he wist not. He no longer had even the discernment to know that there was no power of God in his life. Friends, as we approach the fall season, as we approach another school year, another college year, another year of fall ministry, the spiritual leadership conference, the, the world impact conference, all these things that lie ahead of us that have such great potential for God, we dare not forget where the power is. I am the vine. You are the branches. He that abideth in me, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. We're not sufficient of ourselves. To think anything is of ourselves, our sufficiency is of God. We read a desperate prayer here in verse 21. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with the fetters of brass. And he did grind in the prison house. Howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. Then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon their God and to rejoice. For they said, Our God hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God for they said, Our God hath delivered into our hands our enemy and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. And it came to pass when their hearts were merry that they said, Call for Samson, that he may make a sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house, and he made them sport. And they set him between the pillars. And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may feel the pillars wherewith the house standeth that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines from my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood, and on which it was borne up, of the one with his right hand, the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. We will never know what Samson was supposed to accomplish. We'll never know. His death, his suicide, accomplished more of God's purpose than any of his life. Now think what would have happened if along the way Samson had stopped and said, God, use me. God, empower me. God, may I do this not in reaction to how they're treating me, but according to your divine purpose and plan for my life. Will we ever know 
what God wanted to do in your life? Will we ever see all the plan of God manifested as a result of your life and your testimony? Don't underestimate yourself. Unto him that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. How? According to the power that worketh in us. This community needs us this fall to have a demonstrated power upon the divine plan that God has created you for. Let's not distort our purpose and come to some point in our life with a desperate prayer, Lord, somehow make something out of this. May our life be intentional in these coming weeks to be all that God created us to be. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, thank you for loving us. And Lord, even in Samson's life, we see your grace. As you allowed him this, this final hurrah, I suppose we could say, of some kind of victory, despite his distorted purpose. But Lord, I don't think any of us want a plan B for our life. We want plan A. We want to be all that you designed us to be. We want to accomplish all that you set out to create in us and through us. And so, dear Lord, as we take inventory tonight of our life, may we understand what the will of God is, and may we fulfill it. May we finish our course with joy, knowing that we've done your will intentionally, and not simply reacted to the the, the highs and lows of our life. I pray, Lord, speak to us tonight in Jesus' name. Let's stand quietly with our heads bowed. The music's already playing. The invitation is open. The altar is here. Perhaps tonight you want to come, you just say, Lord, as I go into this week, as I go into this fall, in my individual life, in my family, in my church ministry, I want to be intentional about your purpose. I don't want to just kind of react, well, you know, maybe if inflation comes down, I'll, I'll do this. If, if, if things get a little quieter, a little more comfortable, I'll do that. No, let's be intentional. Let's be what God wants us to be. God may have all these circumstances, all these uncomfortable surroundings, because he longs to use us for his purpose of glory and honor in our community and in our nation. May we be intentional about that. May we not lose sight of that. If you are here tonight without Christ as your Savior, you heard the testimony of one a moment ago who stood in the waters of baptism and testified that he knows Christ as Savior. Do you know him? That power of God is available to his children. Tonight, you can know him, who to know is life everlasting. If you don't know him as your Savior, I invite you to come. Meet one of these workers here at the front. Be happy to show you how you can know Christ as your Savior.